very warm welcome to this evening's um, session, which I for one very much look forward to. Peter Perry has long been an artist, a sculptor, uh, an individual I've been much interested in. And I was delighted to hear through the grapevine, as they say, that there was to be an exhibition opening first in Dahlem and the outskirts of Berlin, as many of you will know, and currently on in Bremen, uh, where Ari Hertog, Hertog sorry, is uh, is uh, director and curator of the show, uh, until the 2nd of June, is that right, Harry? Yes. So yes, yes, if anyone yes. has a chance <laughs> to get there, of course, that would be that would be wonderful. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the Insiders Outsiders project, perhaps I can just say a few very brief words of introduction to that. It was a an idea I had, a small idea that rapidly grew, grew very large, much to my delight. Um, actually, a few years ago now, but uh, a project that would celebrate the celebrate but also sort of examine in a more nuanced and indeed analytical and critical way the immense and pervasive contribution made by refugees from Nazi dominated Europe to this country's culture. And it took the form initially, as some of you will know, uh, of a face to face year long nationwide festival, which was very well received. I found the level of interest was truly, truly gratifying. And then COVID hit and luckily, I suppose if it had to happen, it happened at the right time because most of the events had already taken place. And the obvious uh, way to proceed was like everybody else in the end to go online and that's exactly what we've done and since that time we've been organizing i've been organizing uh, an ongoing program of online events uh, there is a youtube channel i'll mention that again because this uh, event is going to be uh, recorded and uploaded onto that and if you'd like to sign up for the newsletter to be kept informed of future events um, please do so if you go to the uh, the website insidersoutsidersfestival.org and scroll down on the home page it's very easy to sign up to that good well it's a rich subject and of course Perry fits in although he was something of a maverick figure both in Europe and in the UK uh, he does absolutely fit into this bigger story of immensely creative, interesting individuals who made it to the safety of England, but not without difficulties when difficulties and obstacles when, when they got here, as well as obviously in the process of coming. So let me um, carry on now briefly by introducing Dr. Ari Hartog, born in Holland, um, but since uh, 2009, the director of the Gerhard Marx House in Bremen. Uh, he's been curator there for some time from 1996 onwards. So um, yeah, uh, studied in Holland, but uh, very now, very much now based in, in Germany. He's the chair of um, uh, an association focusing, a sort of working group focusing on dedicated sculpture and sculptor museums and sculpture collections, which I don't think we have the equivalent of in this country, but it would be you know, a useful thing to, to have. Uh, his research focus, in his own words, is the history of sculpture in the 20th century and the posthumous afterlife of modernist sculpture. Recent publications include Arp and Company, The Cosmos and of Forms and Studio Practice, 2023, and uh, Prague Sculpture, which is presumably Prague, does that mean Prague-based Sculptures? No, or... it's the it's the it's the, the German minimalist sculptor Heinz Günther Prager. Just shows my ignorance. I'm no thoroughly, problem. No problem. Thoroughly no, no, shut no, up he, there. He's, he's <laughs> not as well another, known in the UK. Another monograph in, in 2022. Yes. Good. All right. <laughs> Very good. Um, good. So I think without further ado, um, I noticed there was somebody else trying to get in, but I'll, I'll concentrate on that in a minute. I'm going to hand over to Ari to uh, introduce us to a, a fascinating figure of Peter Laszlo Perry. Um, thank you, Monica, for your, your introduction, and of course for inviting me to present this small paper on Peter Laszlo Perry. He was born 1899 as Laszlo Weiss from a Jewish family in Budapest, and he died 1967 in London. His father, he adopted the Hungarified name Perry in 1918, as in Hungary after the end of the Habsburg Empire, German names, they disappeared very quickly and the pressure on Jews with German names even was stronger. So this Hungarian artist fled his home country after the downfall of the revolution of 1919. Since 1920, he lived in Berlin and as a communist and a Jew, he was forced to leave in 1933. And this indicates that the question of outsider insider is a constant factor in his biography. In Berlin, he was seen as an emigre like he was in London. In Germany and in Hungary, he's mostly known as Laszlo Peri or, or as 
Ladislaw Speri. In the UK, as Peter Perry or as Peter Laszlo Perry. But it's important to understand that it's one and the same. The German National Library lists him under eight different names. And we even found two more variants. So we agreed on Peter Laszlo Perry, which is the name he himself preferred from the 1950s on. So I'm now going to share my, and that's this one. So in this paper, I will present you some aspects of his biography, some works that are part of the exhibition and some works we cannot show and some new things we are working on. I will not go into chapters we have dealt with in this bilingual catalog. So this paper may be a reason for you to read it. And I can also inform you that English museums were not interested in showing Perry. So if you want to see the works, you should go to Tate Britain, where two reliefs are on display at the moment, to Coventry. I will talk about that on the end of my lecture or paper, or get a Ryan air flight to Bremen. Our project developed from the so-called AG Bildhauer Museum, which is a working group of sculpture museums in Germany. It's an organization of 40 museums and bequests. And here, the idea rose to do a project on Perry. Who? Yes, Perry, this interesting exile artist who was in Berlin avant-garde circles in the early 1920s and later became a figurative sculptor in England. Kunsthaus Haus Dahlem in Berlin, it is a relatively young museum. It's housed in the former studios of the famous and or infamous sculptor Arno Breker, Hitler's favorite. And from this history, this peculiar history, my colleagues developed a concept that focuses on that art that could develop once Hitler and Breker were gone. On the one hand, post-war modernism, sorry. And on the other hand, um, they have a very strong focus on exile. So for example, the Kunsthaus initiated the exhibition on Yusuf Abo in 2019, another emigre forced to come to England in the 1930s. On the other hand, the Gerhard Marx House in Bremen, where I work, it holds the bequest of this sculptor, Gerhard Marx, whom you may all know as the maker of the Bremen uh, town musicians. And our focus is similar, not so much on exile, but on the history of modern sculpture and unknown artists. And as Marx himself started as a teacher at the Bauhaus and later became a figurative sculptor, we are very much interested in artists who turned their back on avant-garde. We made this exhibition in close consultation with Peter Perry, the keeper of the artist's estate, who is our main lender. From my part, and I think it's important to tell that, there's also another thing that interests me, and that is the strange history of communist art in the early 20th century. We all know that a lot of artists sympathized with the Russian Revolution and Western art history has always had a strong interest and sympathy for those artists that had a leftish agenda and were aesthetically progressive. On the other hand, communist art history was just as selective and preferred those artists working in a clear socialist realist mode. But the interesting thing is, of course, that while we have a clear image of socialist realism in the 1930s and 40s Russia, the question is hardly ever asked how it developed. And secondly, whether there were alternatives at the time. And it turns out that Peter Laszlo Perry is a fantastic test case as he forces you to think differently about all these categories we use so easily. And it all has to do with biography and chance. This is why I show you this picture. 
almost no art historian, even in Germany, knows Heinz Tichauer. And my lectures on Perry always mention him. He's gone. He was killed and then removed from art history. But in the late 1920s, he was the chairman of the so-called ASSO, the Association Revolutionaire Bildender Künstler, the Association of Revolutionary Visual Artists in Berlin, uh, in Germany. He made this non-heroic proletarian in 1929, and the city of Berlin bought it to present it in front of one of the, the railway stations. But that did not happen. Like Perry, he was forced to leave Germany in 1933, and via Prague and Paris, he went to Moscow, where he was killed during the Stalinist purges of 1938. And similar things happened to quite some communist artists from Perry's circle. Some were as adaptive to survive the Soviet Union, the more creative, the independent ones, they were killed. And Perry, he was lucky. He, was, he could emigrate to the UK thanks to his second wife and became British citizen in 1939. For Tichauer, I know of 10 works and only a few have survived visually. When he was rehabilita rehabilitated sorry, after Stalin's death, all traces of him had been removed, first by the Nazis and then by Ger East German communists following Russian orders. And the point is that due to this, Tichauer is just an example, we have a strange void in German art history. We only know of communist art of the 1920s that was compliant to GDR art history, but there was more. And looking at Peter Laszlo Perry gives us a glimpse. So here he is. To the left, you see him standing at the Sturmgalerie um, during his exhibition in 1922. He's standing next to one of his space constructions. And the interesting thing is, of course, the form of this carton. Works like this made Perry in the late 1960s or early 1970s, the inventor of the shaped canvas and a precursor of the American painter Frank Stella. The, painter, the painting itself combines flatness and spatial illusion, and this is a topic we will find throughout his oeuvre. Look at the outline of the lower part of the carton, and you will see how the vertical outline ends where the block begins. Outline and image are linked in a way that was radically new as Berlin critics in 1922 acknowledged. And the interesting thing is 1922 is this situation where the whole art scene in Berlin looks at this artist and says, wow, that's interesting. That's something new. On the other picture, you see Perry around 1932 working on a figurative sculpture and here, he has obviously left progressive abstract avant-gardism. But what he is making is not simple figurative sculpture, but a work by which he is himself positioning in the discussion around 1930. And here we see a second problem to the missing communist sculpture of the late 1920s, and that is this antagonism between abstraction and figurative art, by where or whereby we one could say we are told that all figuration is conservative. But this small, plump guy with his folded arms has nothing to do with neither Berlin mainstream contemporary bourgeois sculpture, nor with this communist heroic realism that evolved around the same time. But let's start at the beginning. As far as we know, Perry started at a lawyer's office and then began an apprenticeship as a stone mason, mason. Sorry, This is important as this political art, active artist. He was a worker 
himself. And we always think that stonemasons just hit stones. But the interesting thing is that when you go into what a stonemason learned in the early 20th century, working with concrete was part of the job. And that would become later on in his career after he moved to the UK. We know that he was active in leftish circles already in Hungary and worked in a theater and then participated in the Hungarian Soviet from March to August 1919. He had to leave the country and via Paris and Vienna, he turns up in Berlin in the circle of Herbert Weiden around the Sturm, this famous gallery and magazine with close links to, on the one hand, East Europe, being avant-garde and Russian communism. You see an early drawing by Perry as it was published in Der Sturm. And it will remind you of Alexander Archipenko and his play with positive and negative space. Archipenko was the main artist of Der Sturm. And the drawing in the middle is a step further, both when it comes to the triangle on the right side between the legs and the head, which is both a negative and a positive form, dependent on what you identify. And on the right side, you see a wooden sculptor, sculpture. And works like these indicate that when Perry arrived in Berlin, he was working in a Archipenko-influenced form of expressionism. And it must be said, that was not very up-to-date in 1921. But then in 1922, he turned to constructivism and became a forerunner. Here you see the famous portfolio of, of linoleum prints, the Sturm published in 1923. And there are two ways of looking at these motives. One would, the first would underline the relationship between flatness and space. There's always a hint of perspective, but it's never defined. So you might think of Perry as an artist interested in overlapping perspective, but digging into the sources, you will find another context, and that is the Vienna and Berlin-based Hungarian avant-garde. One of the ideas promoted there was what you uh, what they called build architecture to be translated as picture architecture. And Perry's friend, Lajos Kasak, advocated an anti-illusionist concept of images. Rather than receding into perspective depth, the image should move uh, into space on the strength of its unmistakable identical parts in clear arrangement. So the idea is not that this goes into the depth of space, but comes out. Whether that works, well, come and visit the exhibition, you will see. Another friend of Perry, Kalai, he established then a direct link between constructive form and Marxist content. And there it becomes interesting. He said that this distribution of all elements in a well equal way on the plane is the representation of a communist political aspiration. And socialism here always meant obedience to Moscow. Perry and his friends, it's also an interesting footnote, agitated against what they called bourgeois constructivism. And bourgeois constructivism was mostly Dutch constructivism like the style. And they said, our constructivism was ba is based on communist principles, which would become art in the form of collective architecture for a society of the future. 
And for this cause, and that is also quite important because it is already uh, relevant very early in Perry's career, these artists state that, quote, they should subordinate their personal interests to those of the proletarians. So individual styles are not the issue. On this space construction on the right side, you will see a hint of foreshortening in the table. But is it a table? Is it a simplified depiction of reality or did Perry already play with perception? There is a strong hint, like I said, in a contemporary theory, but no proof yet as written sources are rare. The Hungarian constructivists argued that no element within a composition should be subordinate to others, a kind of communism of the flat plane which is a thought you will find with other constructivists also. And until 1924, and that should also be uh, mentioned, constructivism was a modernist style used for Soviet propaganda in the West. And Berlin was the capital of this. This whole idea that there was something like bourgeois constructivism and there was something like socialist, that is communist constructivism, for us nowadays is quite strange, but it explains part of the discussions of the time. And for Perry, this discussion was very relevant. Um, the whole idea of an equilibrium of visual means uh, becomes more clear when you have a look uh, at the his whole playing with outlines and then turn them around and play with it. And you really get to feel, oh, yeah, he is looking for a, a stable composition without um, going back to standard uh, forms of outlines. And on the left, you see two versions of one competition. The one is a painting, the other is a print. And the interesting thing is, of course, freestanding motives were nothing new for a woodcut, but they were still printed on a piece of paper. But Perry then is really very much fixed on making these forms objects for themselves. So the painting in the middle, the outline is exactly the form. It's not on a um, rectangular canvas. And for example, the portfolio I showed you earlier um, these colored forms on there, they were cut out and glued on the paper so as to make the difference visible. Small printed objects on paper. Two images, 1921, 1923. Two styles, one as a poster for the revolution to the left, and the other one for a art magazine, same artist. And of course here, the problem becomes apparent that would haunt all discussions on Marxist art. And that is the usability of avant-garde as propaganda. And the answer came from Moscow and it was no. And here on the right, you see two posters from Perry from 1924 and where the motive, motive comes from. So constructivism is over, and now artists pick up the so-called politkult from the early 1910s, heroic depictions of workers. We also know that Perry worked as a cartoonist, but um, that is a completely different uh, 
field um, that is very much on, you know, uh, typical German art historical problems I will not go into today. And here, at this next image, you will see the final twitch of constructivism. In 1924, he made a design for a Lenin monument. And Adolf Bede, a close friend, included his, this design in his famous book on modern architecture, Der Moderne Zweckbau. And um, it was because of this picture in that book that Perry became famous. I mean, this design is famous. A lot of people do not know the artist. And the funny thing is, of course, that Bene made a book on utilitarian architecture about how modern architecture would develop and had been built with uh, concrete, glass, and iron. And that includes this one work by a close friend that is nothing but a fantasy. But in this time, at this time, um, Perry still calls himself a painter, but he is also working as an architect, um, which is something you will find with a lot of constructivist artists in Berlin, mid 1920s. Architecture seems to be the art form to really help changing society. He then starts as a sculptor. He makes an exhibition. Um, the exhibition is reviewed in communist papers, but it was never advertised. So it was just for a small inner circle of communist intellectuals who were discussing the future of communist aesthetics. And while such a discussion was impossible in Moscow, you could do it in Berlin. So Piri, and that is the really interesting thing about his bequest, is that we know about 25 works of him from this period. Two have actually survived, but um, we have, or three, but we know pictures of them. And you see how he is working in very different styles. On the one hand, to the left, um, something that you could define as anti-bourgeois nudes. Berlin, at that time, sculptors are making very elegant, sporty kind of female nudes, and Perry makes the contrary to it. In the middle, it's about, it's a washing woman. It's about the perils of proletarian life. Um, and to the right, the idea of the heroic future of communism. And the interesting thing is that while the Soviet line would be the right one, Perry, when he came to England, would stay with the two other modes of style. And in Leeds, the Henry Moore Institute, holds an enormous collection of drawings by Perry. And any colleague in the UK interested in re realism should have a look at those. There are a few thousand, and they're really waiting to be discovered. Here you see there is one folio of drawings from Berlin, about 300 of them. But now we move. Um, in around 1932, and that is the street corner meeting to the right, Perry discovered concrete. As a stone mason, like I said, he knew the material. And he knew that communist artists in Germany saw it as appropriate. It was neither Bourgeois, bourgeois bronze, nor marble, but a material of our times. To the left, you see a sculpture of Lucy Posok-Jan, 
that was cast in concrete around 1925. She was a Dresden communist working with this material for casting it. But Perry did something different. He started modeling it and he developed a technique for making reliefs. And the proletarian factor here should not be underestimated as making such a piece is really dirty work. And the complete opposite to the, you could say, bourgeois academic making a model and then giving it to the workers to transfer it into materials. So by modeling in concrete, Perry showed in his working method that he was a proletarian. In March 1933, shortly after the Nazis seized power and their terror against communists reached a new peak, Perry and his second wife, Mary McNachten, were able to leave Germany and they emigrated to London. As far as can be reconstructed, he became one of the founders of the Artists International Association, IAA, the leading left-wing artist organization in England. In 1936 came Perry's first solo exhibition from Constructivism to Realism at the Foyle Gallery in London. And then for a short time, a few years, Perry becomes the favorite of the art critic Anthony Blunt. Blunt saw abstract art as the expression of the alienation between art and society, and the 1936 exhibition showed also two bronzes that the artist had been able to rescue from Berlin, a mother and child in a nude. And also, and that's interesting, showed some constructivist works. So Blunt argues that the exhibition showed an artist who, quote, after tasting to the full the sweets of pure form, has returned to realism, end quote. And he even went one step further. This exhibition, therefore, is of vital importance in showing how art can develop at present out of abstraction into realism without even sacrificing its old achievements. Blunt's enthusiasm for Perry's work culminated in other solo exhibitions, Cambridge 1937, which he himself curated under the title The New Realism in Sculpture. So Perry is positioned in the middle of the British discussion about abstract or figurative art. And my feeling, but that's not my real field, is that him being championed by Blunt or another famous Marxist art critic, critic Francis Klingender, was one of the reasons why Perry stayed an outsider. It was the same in Germany or England. Fervent Marxists saw him as an important artist, the bourgeois establishment ignored him. And then after, 19, after 1945, Marxist art doctrine aligned more and more with Moscow and Perry became a double outsider, except for, that would be a paper in itself, John Berger, who would become and stay a fan. As far as we can construct, Perry's early work in London were mostly reliefs. He did not have a studio until 1938. So like his wife told in an interview, one must imagine him modeling these reliefs in concrete on the kitchen table. And also the industry is uh, interested. In 1938, he presented his exhibition, London Life in Concrete in Soho Square, and introduced the visitors to his sculptures in colored cement. The show was sponsored by the Cement and Concrete Association, which also commissioned the artist with this large format wall piece. It's about 60 centimeters high for its boardroom. Perry modeled in concrete, 
very often in situ by now. And from this, he developed a new word, pericrete. This is the um, Stalin that is in the collection of the Tate, but not on this plate. And of course, it is not Soviet realism, but a strange kind of over-the-top alternative. And on the other hand, it shows his admiration for this dictator. Perry was a convinced communist, probably until the nine, late 1950s, but sources for this are rare. Stalin died in 1953, and from 1956 on, after Khrushchev's speech on the cult of personality, there is this process of de-Stalinization that slowly reaches Western communists. So it should also always be seen that while one can call Perry left-wing or progressive, there is always this typical selective humanism against capitalism and fascism, but turning a blind eye when it came to communist terror. But it must be said, he was consequent in this. In 1952, he participated, which I think is very intriguing, in the international competition for the monument to the unknown political pris prisoner. And this is also one of the things where I would advise English colleagues to dive into. The Henry Moore Institute in Leeds holds a sculpture where they think it's the um, design for the monument, but we now know that's wrong. What you see here is the one. And that was a competition for Berlin. And the idea was, of course, it was meant as a anti-communist Oh, sorry, wrong button. Um, it was meant as a anti-communist um, monument. Perry submitted this work and used then the IAI newsletter to speak out against the whole idea of this competition, which is a very intriguing kind of positioning himself. And he speaks, he says, there is a vastly differing notions of what was meant by political imprisonment and also human freedom. It means something different on both sides of the Iron Curtain. Quote, in his time, after all, political prisoners had come from a multitude of different camps, fascists and anti-fascists pacifists and anarchists, communists and anti-socialists. All of them had to endure persecution and imprisonment depending on the vagaries of politics in their home countries. Indeed, not long ago, even Adolf Hitler and his entourage might have been locked up as political prisoners. End of quote. So, Perry argued that by entering their works, the participating sculptors could not avoid adopting a political position themselves and thus contributing to a escalation of the conflict between East and West. This is, a, I think, one of the most intriguing chapters of Perry and him positioning in the uh, in the discussion of the early 1950s, both international and um, English in England. So his reliefs then in the 1950s, I think, are among his best works, where he is really combining old and new, it's about figuration, but he still thinks about the whole idea of forms from his abstraction. This is why I put the linoleum from the early 1920s next um, to it. And um, I think this is a very underestimated uh, group 
of work by Perry, also because he is obviously, um, after he has left Germany, he's still um, thinking about modes of depiction he has learned from modern photography. And in 1948, he suggests to London County Council that new housings in Lambeth should be enhanced with wall sculptures. And he says, I am going to execute them directly in wet concrete. And these works, they are still excellent today. They paved the way for a whole series of commissions for public spaces in various places in England, Leicestershire, Yorkshire, Derbyshire, and Yorkshire. And Perry then in a few of his articles says, well, this should be the future of sculpture, not autonomous sculpture, but the combination of sculpture and architecture as a return to the connection these two art forms had in history. Perry argued then that clients no longer saw sculpture as an integral element of architecture, but they saw it as something additional. They thought of it as something inessential which just inflated the costs of building projects. And his sculpture should be seen as an alternative. And one of the arguments you will always also find then is that he said, well, I'm going to go there and I'm going to do it while the workers make the building. So he thought of his sculpture as depicting modern society and as sculpture, in architecture had traditionally always been executed in the materials used for the building, Perry followed that tradition and worked with mm. cement. Around 1955, he then began working with synthetic resin and combinations of concrete and polyester. And from there on, he developed the idea of diagonal sculptures of modern buildings. It's a simple kind of symbolism, uh, just to give you uh, some examples. But modern art in the UK had by then, you all know that better than me, developed in a different way. The whole idea of a new realism was over. And it would be interesting to examine, examine where Perry could still exhibit in the 1950s and 60s. On the one hand, he was able to organize small scale exhibitions where he sold his work, but he was also excluded from the bigger shows. Or did he not even try to get in? We know that next to his work as a sculptor, he was also working for some time full time in a factory which is a very clear indication that he could not live of his art alone. Perry was real working class. Perry, and that is definitely not my field of expertise, became something I feel like a independent Marxist sculptor in the UK. The aforementioned John Berger published his first novel on a Hungarian painter that was obviously modeled after Perry. And there is a similarity in Berger's and Perry's belief that art should never be judged by its aesthetic value alone, but by its capacity to help viewers to see their collective power. And in Perry's case, it was linked to the idea that every man and or woman in their actions, just as they were, were suitable for art. His critique of the English art system and establishment got more and more explicit. As he said, it only functions to widen the gap between the art lovers in Bond Street and ordinary people. This position was, of course, ignored. In the second half of the 1950s, you could call this his personal de-Stalinization. 
Perry became a Quaker and became known for his graphic works. What is interesting then is that he was very much into technique. Um, we have some of his etchings uh, at the exhibition now in uh, Bremen and the profession, professional uh, graphic artists, uh, they are come all coming by and like, wow, how did he do it? And obviously Perry had a very strong identity, not only of doing or being able to do something, but also to be inventive. And this is, I think, the most important work of his later career, the so-called Coventry sculpture, made for the new museum in the city. And if you are in Coventry, you sh should go there and have a look, or even go there and have a look if you are not there. Because here Perry, I think, tried to combine his figurative sculpture with a system of non-hierarchical presentations that has been the goal of his early abstract works. So the very moment you dig into this artist, you will find that while there are different styles, there is an attitude, a political attitude, and some striking constants in his work, the work of Peter Laszlo Perry. This Hungarian sculptor who li subsequently lived in Berlin and London gives an important hint that we should think again about where art, sculpture, communist aesthetics stood in Germany before 1933 and how this was then able to develop further in the UK. And in doing so, it might confirm, I don't know, it's a tentative question, the thesis of Robert Burstow in our book that Perry attempted an alternative socialist realism that did not fall back on the 19th century, but took all, all the achievements of modernisms. I think that is um, an interesting artist to work on. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, Ari. That was, as expected, very, very interesting indeed. Do you want to just stop? Um, yes, there, there we go. And um, perhaps I'll just... Uh... I had to find my mouse, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Good. Um, Fine. Uh, now is the moment to ask any questions or indeed proffer any comments. There is one very practical question, but perhaps we can just start by looking in a little bit more detail at certain aspects of his fascinating life that you didn't obviously have time to dwell on in any detail. First of all, his very his family beginnings. Tell us a little bit more about the family background. How much time do you have? I well, mean, the, the, <laughs> the, yeah. the, the, the interesting thing is that uh, Hungarian colleagues uh, did some research um, on it and um there is uh we know uh, but we know actually uh, not uh, there has not been too much archival uh, research on him because the most interesting things that people have found over the years about him were the um how you call it the papers of the uh, uh, perry being mentioned in the papers of the um secret service so obviously um, they uh, wanted, um, he was known as a communist. Uh, we know that he had, I think, um, he was one of eight children. So a big, and he was the eldest son. And the idea was that the eldest son should become a lawyer. And then he decides not to become a lawyer. He starts in a lawyer's uh, office but then he uh, becomes a stone mason. And that is all stories that uh, we, all, we only know from uh, stories he himself uh, wrote down later on when he was in England. But it was a working class family, am I right? Which is quite unusual, I yes. think, as artists go. Yeah. And well, where did the, the, well no. that, is, that is, of course, I mean, I mean let's, let's go one step back. The interesting thing of the early 20th century is, of course, that more and more people get this idea of, you know, uh, coming out of their original uh, kind of background. So um, I um, I would have to dig into that what exactly the father did. I was wondering, I know that 
Perry's grandson, also Peter, was hoping to be here, but he did warn me that he might not be able to, and I can't actually see him, sadly, no. in the audience, but it would be nice no. to know indeed a little bit more. I don't know how much he knows, in fact. And what about the precise circumstances of him having to leave Germany and coming to this country? Am I right in thinking his wife was an English woman? She was yes. politically active. Yes. Yes, and it was actually... Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, the, the wife and the sister... They were uh, quite known uh, in uh, Berlin um, communist circles. And uh, that's also the reason, because when he left, obviously his studio um, and his uh, where he lived uh, the, uh, was destroyed. But uh, some works that were with the sister uh, she was able to bring them to England later on. And that is the reason why a few early works have survived. And we were discussing this before we went on air, as it were, the fact that he did live for a while in Hampstead, indeed in Willow <coughs> Road, which is where also you know, Goldfinger, the Hungarian architect, lived. And indeed the house is still open to uh, the public through the National Trust. And it was very close to a whole number of politically active, not communist necessarily, but left-wing individuals who were wanting to do their bit, you know, for, for left-wing causes, both in the 30s yes. and indeed in and, the war and that would also, I wonder, the, yes, how the, much the, how much communication was there between them? Well, the thing is, um, and that is one of the things where I think uh, one should, you know, um, get to the archive in Leeds and have a look at that. Uh, there are some memories of uh, British uh, left-wing intellectuals uh, who write that they were living with Perry at that time and that they say, well, Perry had no, uh, he was living under very difficult circumstances himself, but nonetheless, he let us live in his house. Uh, so he, he played some role there. Interesting. As you yes. say, there's much, much more to be found out. Now, yes. there's a question yes. specifically about Leeds from Joe Hooks, who's looking, I think, perhaps keen to, to talk, if you'd like, Joe. But just a very practical and obvious question in a way. How is it? Why is it that the Henry Moore Institute in Leeds holds quite so much information and material on Perry? How did the work end up there? And are there indeed any of his sculptures and reliefs? As well yeah, there, as are some, there are some, some sculptures and also re, uh, an important relief there. And it just has to do with uh, one of the former directors, Penelope Curtis, who had interest in Perry and uh, convinced the keeper of the bequest at that time uh, to donate um, a lot. On the one hand, I think they, they bought some pieces, but I'm not sure. And then donate this whole uh, bunch of archival material. So, so there's a, they're part of the archive on British uh, sculptures, and it's a, it's an enormous amount of material. I it took me five days uh, just to flip through, and it's all the more shameful that they don't appear to want to actually do a major exhibition or even a minor <laughs> exhibition of Perry's work. That's not uh, not a good reflection on them. But anyway, uh, Joe, I don't know whether you wanted to sort of add something or. or... Was that just a simple question? No, I, I just wanted to ask that because um, I think that this could be a real vein of research for Leeds Modernist, who are an organisation that um, promote modernist architecture, and that it might be something that they could look at and something that they might want to research. That's all. I just was really interested yes. um, in his work, and I have a connection with Leeds Modernist. Um, I come from Blackheath, where his uh, sunbathers was found in a hotel in the yes. Clarendon Hotel, <laughs> bizarrely. Right. Yes. Um, I have a connection with these modernists, and um, I thought this would be really something that they could promote and explore and maybe do more research on. That was all. Yes. No, it's a PhD begging to be written, isn't it? It is. It is. It really is about his London, mm -hmm. his, uh, his English life. Indeed, indeed. Um, I notice also, Harriet, I don't want to put you in an awkward position and you're... <laughs> I can only see your photograph at the moment, but Harriet Atkinson, Ari, I don't know whether you're aware, she's very much an expert on the Festival of Britain and has given a talk, in fact, for Insiders Outsiders some while ago, specifically on the disproportionate role played by the former refugees in the yes. Festival of Britain. I wonder, um, as I say, Harriet, I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you could say a little bit more perhaps about the way he, or how he, again, how he came to be part of the Festival of Britain project, that would be really, really interesting. Yes, I'd, um, I, uh... Uh, I really, really enjoyed that talk. Thank you so much. It was fascinating. And I've got um, your book, the book of the, um, I can't, I'm not sure if that really comes into focus, but anyway, um, 
Uh, I've got the the, the catalogue of the um, fascinating catalogue, and I haven't been to the show yet, um, Ari, but um, I'm hoping to make it to Bremen. Hmm. Um, my film um, Art on the Streets is is currently showing in in the gallery, um, yes. which is partly about. Um, Perry, as you know, um, and also draws on Betty Ree, whose work is also at um, Henry Moore Institute. Um, um, but um, to your question um, or your point, Monica, about Perry's involvement with the Festival of Britain, um, do you know, I can't, I can't remember why he was invited to... Um, um, I can't remember who it was. I, th I, I, think, uh, I think it was Misha Black who invited um, Perry to, um, somebody else may, may remember more, but, I, but because he was, he was exhibiting his, um, his piece, The Sunbathing Group, um, in the area of the Festival of Bristol on the South Bank that M Misha Black was, was, all, was overseeing, I think it was through that route that he was invited to, um, he was commissioned to 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 um contribute that um that work um were there other pieces by perry i'm trying to think no. at the festival of britain was that the only one um no the uh I, I mean that that is something i also just know because the fact that i uh you know i added the, the catalog and uh one of the points is that uh robert burstow makes is that this is the one exhibition where Perry was actually able to do something big, as as you mentioned, Misha Black uh, was the guy, uh, was the one who uh, invited him and was very keen on having Perry do something there. But afterwards, uh, he was not involved in uh, similar projects. Mm. And I wonder, just going back to the 1930s and the Artists International Association, Harriet, again, you know, I think you've delved into some of that, haven't you? I mean, I'm intrigued, you know, Willow Road, the Artist Aid Russia exhibition in the middle of the war and a gold finger. How much do we know about those connections? Yes, this is something I've thought about quite a lot um, because I've um, I've just been writing a book um, about... Um, about AIA's exhibiting practices in the 30s and 40s. Um, and I've and and Erno Goldfinger and Perry and um many, many others come into that story. And I haven't um I haven't connected Goldfinger with Perry with, with those the, the things that you mention um happening in Hampstead, um Monaco. I ha I haven't um Perry isn't he he's in close proximity but not I think overlapping and of course he ends up in Camden in a studio um so there there is there must have been lots of propinquity between all of all of them but I don't I haven't found them exhibiting in exactly the same places from memory and again I you know it, it may be that it, as soon as I say this and and we finish this this talk, um, this call, we'll uh, find it. Yes. Remember, but I can't. I don't know, Ari. I don't, I don't know if you have made connections between. Not, not yet. I, I have been very much focused on the the whole question of whether it is possible to reconstruct the network of uh, Perry in Berlin, which was difficult enough. So, uh, and uh, I mean, you're closer to the archives in uh, in Hampstead than I am. But the Hampstead connection's really tantalising. Yes, I, mean, I wasn't yes. aware until recently that he'd actually lived in Willow Road, because yes, as Harriet yes. says, he's not. it's not a name that comes up in this sort of really no, quite no. close-knit network of people but, living in close proximity to each other. Very yes. interesting, yeah. But there's, there's also one point what we shouldn't forget when we're talking about the European emigres um, coming to London, and that is that they often lived together in, in houses. And that is, that's also one of the things that, I mean, the people came there, they were looking for any possibility to live somewhere. And the very moment you knew somebody being a communist, you knew you had better chances uh, to actually live somewhere. It's, it's, it's similar, we know similar stories about Amsterdam um, in the 1930s uh, that belonging to the party and, you know, uh, enabled you an entrance into the country. 
What about John Hartfield? Now, he was, again, living round the corner. He knocked on the door of the Ullmans in Downshire Hill yes. and stayed yes. for many a long year. But, you know, he was an out-and-out -out communist, Jewish also. One shouldn't forget the two often went together. It's often overlooked. Uh, but, um, you know, absolutely at the heart of that Hampstead community. Uh, was there any connection between the two of them? Yes, there? there must have been con a connection. Yeah. I mean, uh, mm. the interesting thing is that they had both worked for the same uh, newspapers. Uh, they were both in the same kind of propaganda um, machinery of the German Communist Party. So they must have known each other. And it's, uh, but that is the, the interesting thing, um, as a lot of uh, what happened in uh, Berlin between 1928 and 1933 uh, was in a kind of underground subversive way uh, we have almost no traces but they must have known each other mm -hmm. fascinating there's lots more i'd like to ask and explore but i'm noticing that rose would very much like to unmute herself and tell us something about uh, her connection with with perry rose please do um there we are okay um we are in hampstead um in the 60s my husband went to an exhibition a swiss cottage library Mm -hmm. of Peter Perry's maquette sculptures. And at the time, he couldn't afford to buy anything. Later on, after we were married in the 70s, we thought about this and we managed to trace his widow because he had died. And we went down to Brighton uh, to meet her. And she had a garage full of his work. And we ended up buying, um, I'm looking at them at the moment, I'm not going to show them to you, there, there's one in concrete, the like maquettes, of a man sitting, leaning back on a bench, the bench is made of metal, and the other one is looks like it's resin, and it's a standing man pulling a chair behind him, and that's made of metal. Uh, they're really charming pieces, we couldn't buy anything big, but I think we did get um, something that was eventually put onto a building that my husband was involved in uh, on the wall, outside wall. Unfortunately, I think that's long gone. I'm sorry about that. Um, and I'm sorry we didn't get any more because she was clearly a bit hard up and just wanted to be able to do something with all these sculptures. I have no idea what happened to them all after that. Um, but certainly, I remember picking my way through all of these pieces of work, um, absolutely fascinated, but not being able to uh, decide about what to bring up with us. And then we basically bought the two things that were portable. <laughs> um, so that's why we've always had an interest in his work ever since. And I'm really sorry we're not going to be able to get to your exhibition, um, but... Uh, it, the, I'm so pleased that you are doing this research and have done this research and the whole idea of the modernist sculpture it is very interesting to us. Mm -hmm. um, Ari, have you, thank you Rose. Have you thought yeah. about actually um, creating a sort of detailed online exhibit, sort of digital version of the exhibition so at least you know, the material is kept for posterity? <laughs> you obviously don't find the idea too appealing, but not yet. Not yet. I mean, no. that is something one should discuss. Mm. Uh, the on the, the 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 problem is always with these guys. I mean, I mean, Perry is now an interesting. Uh, like I said earlier, uh, he interests me also because of my interest in the, the whole history of communist artists in the late nineteen twenties in Germany. So I will probably do more on him. And I might also uh, publish more on him. So that's, uh, we'll see what's going to happen. There is a new book in the pipeline on the AIA, which is long overdue, yes. because um, um, I'm trying to remember actually, Harriet, somebody who came to the premiere, the showing of your wonderful film. I'm trying to remember, Andrew, yes, somebody? Um, Andy Friend. Andy yes. Friend, Andy that's Friend right. Is, I don't know whether you've been in touch with him at all. Yeah. Um, mm, mm, he, so lots he, of sort of... Connections and loose loose threads. Yes. Just say in case of interest, um, on on Andy is um is is writing a book for Thames and Hudson about AIA, but he's also um um producing two two shows. One's going to be at the Towner Gallery in Eastbourne mm -hmm. oh, okay. about 
AIA, um, three, th three or four artists from the AIA, but also there's going to be an archival show opening in June at Tate Britain, oh. all about the, um, the AIA in that kind of quite large archival gallery in the bottom of, of um, Tate Britain. Well, it would be interesting to see uh, what role, uh, I mean, in the publications on IAA so far, uh, Perry plays no big role. Mm. Um, whereas uh, it would be interesting to see um, if they come up to, with a, well, say, re-evaluation of his position. Mm. Because the interesting thing, what you, the very moment you you dig into this artist um, you, and into the archival materials, we know, for example, the Hungarian Secret Service uh, already in the nineteen uh, in the nineteen uh, twenties they were aware that he was a very good organizer. Fascinating. I can't resist just adding uh, this is sort of by the way, but not irrelevant that the archival gallery that Harriet has yes. mentioned down in the bowels of Tate Britain was very largely financed by Marie yes. Louise von Motoschitsky Trust, yes. who is a wonderful. Jewish artists of Austrian origin came to this mm -hmm. country. Um, and there is actually, as well as that, there and, and it's a fabulous space, has done some fascinating shows on related themes, among others. But there's also a lovely exhibition of her work at Berghaus and Hampstead Museum in Hampstead, as we speak. It opened just last week and it's on mm -hmm. for several months. So those of you who are London based, do, do go and uh, check that out. Wonderful. Well, listen, I'm looking at the time. I think it's probably um, time to draw things to an end. But it, if anybody has any last Minute thoughts or questions now, now is the moment. All right, well, um, as I say, it's been recorded. The recording as usual with our events will be uploaded shortly onto the Insiders Outsiders YouTube channel. I've mentioned Harriet's talk on the Festival of Britain. There's a whole plethora of sort of a array, rich array of other talks on related uh, topics, which hopefully those of you who don't know the YouTube channel will find interesting to dip into. Um, I should also mention just looking ahead that this time next um, next week, um, it is a Monday, let me just double check, or is it the Tuesday? No, it's the Monday, that's right. So um, I'm going crazy here, aren't I? No, it's next Monday, not today's Tuesday, isn't it? Next Monday is a talk on a different but equally fascinating subject organised by Insiders Outsiders by John Idenau, who's the author of a new book on Esther Simpson, who, as some of you may know, was one of the driving forces behind the Academic Assistance Council, as it was called, the Society for Protection of Science and Learning, which did a huge amount to welcome and receive emigre academics to this country. Really, really rich topic as well. So do, if you're interested, do check that out on the Insiders Outsiders Festival website. The What's On section is where you need to head. So it only reminds, uh, remains for me to say thank you very much. We've got thank yous coming you're in, welcome. as you can probably see, Ari. We'll keep in touch. And, you know, I think to keep in touch with Andy Friend, see what comes out from his yes. research. It's all very interesting. So hopefully there will be projects and uh, <laughs> collaborations in the future. Thank you all for being here and I look forward perhaps to seeing you at future events and Ari, once again, thank you so much for yeah, your time. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you. Bye. All the best, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night.